First we'll do just sort of quick introductions of who we are. I'm Ash, I'm the fundraising manager for Swim Taika. So I handle uh, stuff about like just giving, um, reaching goals, things like that. But because we're such a small, close-knit charity, I am also pretty knowledgeable about all the other stuff as well. Um, and I'm a really good first point of contact for any questions that you might have. Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, yeah, I am. So I'm Amy. Um, I am the ambassador for the Bali program. So I volunteered with Swim Taker um, two years ago and I went to Bali. And as I said, I had it booked with a friend and my friend could no longer make it. So I ended up going on my own. Um, and it was absolutely terrifying, but it, it was just such a fantastic program. And it was so amazing when we got there, meeting all the children, finding out what Swimdo did and how hard they work and the local volunteers work out there. I just wanted to help them more. So this year I'm going back to teach the local volunteers how to be, to train them up to be swimming teachers. Um, and a couple of my teachers are joining me. So Caitlin is one of them and um, Sarah is another one. Is Sarah coming on the call, Caitlin? I thought she was, but she's not here, is she? She yeah, did. She, she does have a long way to people. She RSVP'd, yes, but... Should I text her? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she might have just forgotten. Um, so, yeah, so then I thought, well, the ambassador opportunity came up and I thought, well, this is perfect. So I can go out, train up the teachers, uh, train up local volunteers, and I can help other people on the programmes and just help you feel a bit more at ease about what it entails and what's what the plan is. That's me. Thank you. Robert, would you like to have a quick introduction of yourself? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm way, I was... Um... I was occupied and it's like 11 o'clock here just now, so I'm a bit tired as well. But, um, I'm Robert, I'm one of the trustees, I'm also ambassador. Um, I've been involved, I think, three years now. I've been in Mozambique twice, been in Peru, I've done work in Ghana and Tunisia, doing voluntary work, um, running programmes. Uh, I'm a trainer, very similar to Amy. Um, and I run the Pool Lifeguard course and the Swimming Teachers course as well as run the project. So, for example, Mozambique last year, within two weeks, we taught um, five, the first five women in Mozambique ever to be trained in Swimming Teacher and Pool Lifeguard, and we taught 1,350 kids in two weeks. Um, and just January, February this year, we were out in Peru, um, doing a programme over there. Um, didn't quite do a, a swimming teacher's course, but we did CPD and basically transformed the whole programme within two weeks. Um, so that's all integrated within the uh, local charity. So, yeah, it's me. Thank you. Um, so, the three of us are here representing Swim Taika. I will give just sort of a brief overview of what Swim Taika does, as I'm sure you all are already fully aware but just you know for clarity um, but Swim Taika is a drowning prevention charity and we work globally although we are a UK based charity um, the global work is working with local organizations and the areas that we're targeting and we partner with them to deliver swimming lessons to children who would otherwise not really be able to access swimming lessons because drowning is one of the leading causes of death across the world. This is a really important mission. And so what Swim Taika does as part of this process is not only offer support to the, um, the, what's the word, the local programs, I guess you say. And uh, that support comes in many different ways. As Robert said, he has gone to places to support them, uh, to teach swimming. Amy is also going to help sort of uh, shape the curriculum that the programs use. And so another part of what Swim Taika does is we help volunteers go out to these programs so that they can offer their valuable skills in these communities that are in need um, so we currently have three active programs that we are working with. We have the one in Bali that Amy is the ambassador of. 
We have one in Brazil. Um, we have an ambassador for that as well. His name is Adam. And we have Peru, which Robert is the ambassador for. So Bali is the next one coming up. Uh, the very first availability starts right at the end of this month. Brazil is the next one that happens more towards the late summer. And then Peru happens January through March-ish. Um, and we have signups that we open throughout the year. We also run English Channel Relays so that people can fundraise if their passion is more towards swimming long distances rather than necessarily teaching. But of course, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so to give a bit more overview of the programs themselves, Amy, would you like to sort of briefly encapsulate the Indonesian program? Uh, yeah, so I did have some photographs as well, but uh, I can't get, India has sent them to me today and now I can't get access to them, so I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I've also just lost my camera, so I can't see anybody. I think you can all still see me. We can still see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the Swim Doe program has actually been running for a while. They've worked with our Swim um, to create a curriculum that focuses on drowning prevention but the local volunteers that are there don't actually have any teaching qualifications or teaching skills so they just like they enjoy what they do they're at school all day they come they finish school and they go straight to the pool and help teach the children so they have actually quite a good um curriculum to follow uh, which has been with the royal life saving society um, so basically what we're going to try and do is help to help with their teaching strategies, their methods of communication, teaching positions, basically just te showing them how to communicate effectively. So what we want the volunteers to do is when they're out there is actually show them how to be swimming teachers. Um, it's not so much they know how to follow the curriculum, but they don't actually know how to teach. And it's a little bit chaotic when you go out there. There's and children running around everywhere in the pool and nobody kind of knows who's responsible for who. So what we're going to try and do is, is get a, a structured programme going while we're out there. Um, and that's it. Does anyone have any questions about what we're actually doing while we're out there or the accommodation, anything like that? What's the um, accommodation like in general? So it's a shared house. Um, there are, it's really frustrating that I can't see you all. Oh, hang on, I might have found you. There we go, I've got you back. <laughs> right, it's the shared house. So it's um, it's quite close to the beach. So it's just a little walk from the beach. And it's, there are four double bedrooms, two bathrooms. So I think one of the double bedrooms has, a sh has its own bathroom. And then the other ones, it's a shared bathroom. And um, there's plumbed facilities. There's a kitchen area, dining area. You can cook there, there's running water, and um, it's not drinking water, you, you have to drink out of the, um, I can't remember what they're called, like when you get in an office, those big water butts, they, they have one of them and they replace that whenever it starts to run low. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, all the rooms have locks on the doors, so you do have your own private space, and they're very spacious as well, they're not, they're not tiny little rooms, there's lots of space in there, so it's actually a really nice place to stay. It is um, Indira, who is... Um, the coordinator at the at Swimdo, it's actually her house. She has two houses, so she lives in one and then we use the other one for accommodation with volunteers. And I think they all stay there when, when we're not here. But yeah, any other questions about that? Anything particular that you want to know about the house? I don't think so. If you have any more, you can always ask at the end as well. So if you'll have another chance. Yeah. Um, I will say a little bit about the Brazil program. So the partner with that is ET, ETIV do Brazil. Um, they're great. A lot of it is similar to what Amy was saying in terms of teaching swimming. There are volunteers uh, there who go and teach regularly so they always have their sort of constant rotation going um they also have 
apartment sort of bits that you stay in there. I think they have a couple of different like small apartment complexes um, with varying amounts of room. So there is some shared space, but there's a possibility of having like your own space. Um, but of course they all manage that and it's not a kind of thing that you have to arrange yourself or worry about. Also, ETIV do Brazil, they have a few programs outside of swimming also. Um, so I think that is helpful to know because when you have finished your swimming volunteering, if you want to do more volunteering while you're there, they can connect you to some of their different things that you can also help out with. I think that's really nice because I don't know, I feel like most people have multiple passions, so if you are passionate about teaching swimming and something else, then it's valuable to have the opportunity to do a little bit of everything. Um, Robert, would you like to share a bit about the Peru program? Yeah, so that's run by Otter Corsa Network, who's and they're based in Huanchaco, which is south of Trujillo. Um, so Huanchaco happens to be one of the top 10 surfing areas in the world, which was pretty impressive when I was out there. The, they have a shared accommodation, so they call it the house, which I think has got seven bedrooms in it. Some of them are sing most of them are single. Uh, they've got a few double bedrooms. Um, but they have... Uh, just what Ash was saying, uh, alternative programs. So they generally work with um, underprivileged children in the local area, uh, in the kind of back in between Trujillo and Huanchaco, um, because there's quite a number of areas in that local vicinity that don't even have any electricity. They work on an education program, um, and it varies from... Uh, environmental impacts to painting and kind of general tasks, but they also had Global Goal uh, programme, which was uh, ensuring that the, the women understood about their bodies or that the girls understood about their bodies. Most of the volunteers that they have are from an educational background, so most of them are doing degrees in education of some description. Um, uh, they've got a few local people that work within the charity as well. Um, and then they extended that programme out into uh, the swimming pool that's just south of the airport in Rahil. Uh, so they've got a 25-metre four-way pool. They do a two-hour session. Um, and there's about 65 to 70 children within that programme. Um, and there's an, an hour in the water um, where they're taught varying skills and in the second hour in reversing the, the group children um they were doing environmental studies with a school teacher in the same grounds as the swimming pools like a back in the uk we would probably say it would be like a community center um and then they have uh, they also have external programs that run uh, so you can get involved in many different things. And the guys that are out there um, are all very active in whatever area they want to be in, um, but then encourage other people to go along and be part of it as well. Um, and we had Georgina, who uh, came out from London this year. Um, so I was there a week um, ahead of Georgina. Then we spent a week together, and then she spent two weeks um, beyond me being there. And um, she was involved in arts and crafts, guitar sessions. Uh, there was like a complimentary music night that they would go along to. She was learning Spanish sessions uh, three times a week. Um, so there's loads and loads of things to do. Um, and uh, it's a great environment because you're getting quite a lot of uh, tourists in that local area just because of the surfing. So you get quite a variety of cultures and as well and really really cheap thank you um i will go over what the volunteer role looks like really quickly 
So as a volunteer, um, you will be both kind of a representation of Swam Taika as well as the program that you are staying with. So even though you will have time to kind of go out and explore, um, enjoy some local cuisine, things like that, it's important to remember that you are representing these charities. And so not that I think any of you are going to do anything crazy, um, but just to be respectful of the town and the culture and the people that are around you. Um, so one, when you get there, when you first arrive, the program will, somebody from the program will come pick you up and you generally will arrive on a Saturday. Um, so have a little bit to get used to any time changes, etc. Um, the program will generally take you on a local tour at some point, usually during the first weekend that you're there. Um, so they will show you important places uh, or just fun places. A lot of this includes like the closest food store, etc. Um, they also will then take you at some point during your journey on kind of like field trips for you to see some local sites and if you are interested in specific things sometimes you can ask them and they are able to take you there or pick you up later depending a little bit on what everybody else is doing so they're always really nice and want you to have the best experience that you can when volunteering it would be your role as a swimming teacher not only to you know teach swimming but also to support the volunteers and the organization that's already there so you don't want to really like go in and step on anybody's toes just be there um, be yourself and you know kind of do your teaching thing there's also they provide uh, meals for you at the program, and everybody's really helpful. So any questions that you, you do have at any point, um, they can always help you with. As far as volunteer requirements, the kind of the things you need to do, everybody here I think has already, you know, filled out our form and made sure to book their place. So after that, the steps are some of the documentation that we need from you, which includes two professional reference letters, um, professional being either like somebody from your job or any academic recommendations that you might have, just sort of depending. It's just not friends or family kind of recommendations. Um, we also require a DBS check that has happened within the last two years. And we also send our volunteers on a safeguarding course, which is all online, so you can do from home. And you may have done a safeguarding course already, so you kind of know what that's like. <clears throat> and that is as well part of the fundraising amount that you have to raise, so it's a no extra charge kind of thing. Um, we do have, as well, uh, we collaborate with a travel agent who can help you plan things if you need. And once there's sort of that stage in the process, I can always connect the two of you. It is also important that any flights are booked as soon as possible because they just kind of tend to get more expensive. And it's important that we have all the information we need to give the partner organization in time so that they can be there to pick you up from the airport, etc. Another thing that is needed from the volunteer is that the fundraising has to be finished a month before going on the, to the program. The sooner the better, as you know, it usually is, but having it finished a month before going out gives us enough time to finish everything to pass you over to the organization so they are completely ready for you. I think that is all the important stuff we were planning on covering today. Yes, Robert. Uh, I think the other thing that I would um, take into consideration 
wherever you happen to go, if English is a second language, um, whether you can do that here or you've got the opportunity to do um, a language course, and it's we're not talking massive amount of uh, time or money or effort in behind it. But if you don't speak the local language, um, it's not that you're going to struggle, but it just will take a little bit extra time, especially if you're talking to the kids, because most of the kids um, in Peru don't speak any English. Um, and that's partly to do with the uh, economic drive within the country. Uh, so the parents might speak English just because there's quite a bit of travelling going up into North America. Um, uh, but in Mozambique, uh, last year, when we, we were working with the people out there last year, the, um, the four women that we had, only one of them could speak English. Two spoke Patonga, which is a local language, and they all had a, an understanding of some description of Portuguese. So just think about how valuable doing uh, a week's course so, for example, uh, Georgina that was in Peru this year, um, she went out and uh, we managed to find her somebody who could do classes for her while she was there. And they were £5 for three sessions, three one-hour sessions a week. And the value behind that was that she could then transfer that knowledge across to the children. Um, but if you're trying to get something across that we would take for granted in the UK, then think about how you're going to impart that knowledge that you have if you can't speak to them. And it's not that they're going to struggle, because I don't speak any other language other than Scottish. Um, but I've managed to deliver the lifeguard courses, swimming teachers courses, and we taught 1,300 kids, 1300 kids last year. And I don't speak a word of Portuguese or Patonga. But I've got quite a creative that we can get this information across. Just thinking about that and uh, put a little bit of investment in it and I think you might have a more valuable time where you're getting something back out of the kids. That's a really good point, Robert. Thank you for bringing that up because I definitely forgot to mention it. Um, to add on to that, we also have resources available for volunteers to begin learning some of these languages before going out. A lot of these resources have been provided by the partner organizations. So they include like specific words and phrases that are useful in teaching swimming. Um, and also things that you might hear the kids say, so you can kind of keep up with that. On top of those resources, there's also like Duolingo is great and it's free. So, if you're interested in pursuing the language even further, there are definitely cheap, easy, and accessible ways to do that. Yeah. Um, are there any questions at this point that we can help with? Um, those resources, Ash, that you just mentioned mm -hmm. then, um, have they been sent out at all, or would you be able to send them out if they haven't? Yes, I can't quite remember if they've been sent out, but I will send them to you, well, to all of you, I suppose, um, again, one way or another. Thank you. Um, also, Sarah texted me back, and she said that she got stuck at the pool chatting to a staff member, um, <laughs> and then there's loads of police on the motorway, so she's actually still driving home. So she's unable to make it today, unfortunately. That's fine. Thanks for the update. We have a staff member who does not stop talking. Like, she will follow you to your car. She's so lovely. But you'll be getting in your car, and she's like, yeah, yeah, see you later. Oh, but just one thing. And she will stand in front of you and not let you leave. So, yeah, Sarah will have tried her best. But no. She said she only left at 20 past seven. They finished last night at half six. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so just a quick one about uh, following on from what Robert said, actually, about... Um, the languages so caitlin for you uh if you do it on duolingo it'll yeah. i think it's indonesian on yeah. duolingo and it's definitely handy to learn mm. but you'll find when you get there bahasa yeah. is the language that generally uh, tourists would speak okay. but um 
all the locals in Bali know how to speak Bahasa. When they speak to each other, it's very different. So depending on on the hierarchy of your family, you speak a different language. It's quite complex, really. But if you learn how to speak Bahasa, you'll be able to speak to everybody. Right. Does that make sense? So, but it's it's good to start with Indonesian on Duolingo. It made a huge difference to me. And when I got there, they were really impressed that I tried. So I knew just basic little bits of it and they're like oh how do you know that I was like well I've just I've been trying but the kids loved it as well because they really like it, it's actually to say I think there was about 30 children at one point and only two or three of them could actually speak English like they all try and teach it in the schools but I think listening to somebody who actually speaks English it's very different for them and they find it really quite hard to understand mm-hmm. are there any other questions um from either of you, yep, Robert. Uh, so uh, uh, if you're, you're obviously going to buy a SIM card, some description, don't buy it at the airport because they'll charge you a fortune for it. Wait until you get to wherever you need to be because you'll get a cheaper SIM. I've done that so many times now. And I, like Mozambique, I just wait 12 hours and I get a SIM that a third of the cost that it would be at the airport. But they'll obviously try and sell you at the airport because they, they put a tax on top of it. Mm. Um, and it's the same, it was the same in Peru. I just waited until I got into Peru and into Wanchaco and then I went away at some card. And I think that was, I worked out about £4 for 10 giga data. I mean, that's, that's even cheaper than it is in the UK. Mm. Yeah, um, and at the airports, like in Bali, it's the same. And in the airport, it was about, I think it was £25, which doesn't sound like a lot it gives you it will give you a month's worth of data but if you do go to a local shop um, you yeah. can get it much much cheaper okay. yeah. Jillian you had your um virtual hand raised uh, yeah um so how many hours do we uh, teach for each day um it's really only a few hours I think I want to say maybe two to three it might vary a bit depending on programs because um, a lot of it I believe is the children coming to the program after school um, that right. maybe depends a bit on like what time you go um, but I think it does that sound about right Amy and Robert where, 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 where is this that you're interested in sorry Jillian is interested in Brazil Brazil. Um, I'm not sure. So, the likes of Mozambique, we were teaching from, we were on full side from 9.30 to four past three. Um, but we had about an hour and a half in between. Peru was only two hours. Ghana, when I was out there, was two hours. Tunisia was three hours. Um, and what you find from these un, um kind of developing countries, uh, especially the likes of Mozambique. I think Peru was to some degree, but maybe not quite as as um, disruptive as what Mozambique was. Um, depending on where you were within the family and depending on what age you were within the family, there'll be certain days that you have duties within the family to do. So, for example, they would have, um, they would have a six-day programme they were working Monday to Saturday and it was the same times all the way through the week um, and they, all the children within the family were all invited to come within certain times um, within the time of allocated either the morning or the afternoon and there was times that you see the kid on a Monday but you wouldn't see them on a Tuesday you certainly not see them on a Wednesday they come on a Thursday, come on a Friday and then not come on a Saturday um, and that's all relative to age range and um, their ability to be able to do things for the house because it's still very much a, if you like, a farming land of living as opposed to commercial kind of land that we have in the UK. Yeah, I think the programmes do differ, so it would be probably best to speak to Adam about the times, teaching times in Brazil. So um, in Bali, they will not teach between 12 and 3 because they say it's too hot. Robert will probably disagree because he's used to the heat. But in Bali, <laughs> yeah, they just won't teach between twelve and three. They say it's too hot. Um, 
all the pools are outdoor you're not very sheltered so make sure if you are to it as well bring a, a hat um it's uh, one thing i really really needed um every day um so there they the children get picked up from school at about three o'clock um they have like a little bus that collects them they bring them to the pool they probably get there for half past three we start teaching at around four again barley time's very relaxed it could be five o'clock before they've actually started doing anything but that the, the target is between four and it finishes around seven and um, very relaxed time but generally you'll get the daytime to go and do something and um, you can go out and visit the waterfalls visit the local area visit the markets and then about three o'clock you head to the pool and you're there till about seven and then you go out for an evening meal that's generally the, the gist of the day during the week there and just going back on what amy was saying there about the weather <laughs> um Whatever you feel, that if you've been to Spain, Turkey, wherever wherever we tend to go on holiday in the UK and um, in Europe, this weather and this heat is completely different. So you need to make sure that you're well covered up. It's uh, I'm currently in Dubai and today was forty two degrees, and the intensity of that heat is insane, and it doesn't stop. I went out yesterday for a walk to go and get food. And it was like walking into a hairdryer, quite literally standing right in front of the hairdryer, and it was burning my face. Um, Peru was even more intense because they've got a UV of 13 plus, although the air temperature might only sit at 30 generally all year round. But the UV level it actually pierces your body, um, so you need to make sure that you're prepared for and you're in and around water, and especially quite a lot of the pools in Dubai don't have any cover. So you're getting it from the sun and then you're getting the reflection from the water. So you're actually getting hit twice. Um, and w for example, in Dubai, we are having to run beach lifeguard courses, uh, beach lifeguard courses at seven o'clock in the morning, because by 10 o'clock it's too warm. So just think about the timings of when things are and make sure that you're well covered up. Yeah. Definitely. You're better off if you want to catch a tan or anything like that, do it when it's cloudy or on the colder days because you'll definitely tan, but you're not going to burn. It's just so easy to burn in countries like that if you're not used to it. Yeah. And, and I don't think Europeans are used to these kind of temperatures, used to warm temperatures, but there's a difference between 30 and 40. Well, it's 49 a week and a half ago here. It's so different from anything I've ever experienced before. Yeah. Going back as no, well. I'm not showing off, by the way, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to your question about um like how long you'd be volunteering. Again, at outside of the swim volunteering specifically, if you're interested, there are the other um program bits that they're doing running at the same time that you could spend your free time volunteering in if you wanted. It's not a requirement, um, but it is an option. Okay. Yeah, I know that sounds good. Yeah, I do like getting involved. Yeah, Amy? Yeah, sorry, follow. Yeah, agreeing with Ash there. Sorry, Indira has mentioned that her uncle has a daycare centre and he would really appreciate some volunteers there. I don't know whether he's wanting it to help teach water safety to the young children or whether it's just to help uh, volunteer at the daycare I'm not sure but that's for during the day where we are that is something that's available to people I know as well some of our um the program heads have said that any volunteers who would be interested in outside of swimming helping teach English is kind of extra valuable as well because a lot of their teachers you know, know English, but are not necessarily native English speakers. So oh. it can be very helpful for both the teachers and the children um, <clears throat> to spend a little bit of time in those classes and kind of help them with that. And so they get to, you know, be around a person who is a native speaker and learn a little bit extra that way. Uh, just obviously, is it Gabriel or Gab? Who's just joined? I believe it's um, Gabriel, but he says he um he doesn't have microphone. Mike, all oh, right, doesn't know. 
Have you got any questions, Gabriel? If you want to type them up, then we can answer them for you. Yeah, um, if he has anything to type at the moment, are there any other questions as well? Um, he said he has no no questions right now. Thank you. Um, food wise, so do we uh, do we need to? Um, so Amy, you mentioned that after teaching you go out for, for food in the evening. So is that like do you go out together for food, or does people like? Um, go out and source the food separately? So the way it works in Bali, what they did, um, your evening meal is included in your um, your fundraising, like in, in, included in the programme. So right. they will take you. So that, um, for us, there's a local restaurant, but it also delivers to the swim do house like um, a takeaway. So you can just tell the local, the um, like Indira and Agis who are there to help you. They're the coordinators. You can tell them what you want to eat. They'll go and pick it up for you or they'll get it delivered. But they'll also take you to like the local restaurants, the local speciality restaurants. There's like a hog roast place and a ribs place and all these amazing places, a good restaurant and things that they take you to. So you're welcome to go to those. It might cost you a little bit extra to put in because you've got a certain budget and it might go over, but the food is so cheap there. It's like, it's crazy cheap. Um, so yeah, if you need to put money in towards it, it'll be they'll be asking for a fiver or something towards your meal. But you don't. There's no pressure. You can just say at any point if you'd just rather go and eat on your own, or if you want to go out somewhere fancy. Whatever you want to do, the the local coordinators will help you help you do that. I think in Brazil, um, your your breakfast and your dinner are pretty covered by the program. Um, although, as Amy was saying, if at any point you do want to go out and kind of do your own thing, that's fine. You're welcome to do that. Um, I mean, I've not been, but just judging from my conversations with previous volunteers, I think it might be um, kind of smart to have set aside a small budget for food, mostly so you yeah. can go out and just like try all the different opportunities also, I know there will be chances for you to just like do a food shop and take food back to where you're staying if you want to, I don't know, like get some bread and jam, uh, some snacks, stuff like that to carry around with you. You will have, okay. I, I think, multiple opportunities to do that. Um, I'm pretty sure there is a small shop like within walking distance that you'll be able to go to as well okay that's fine thank you something i would point out there um is i would look into where you're going and make sure that there's home comforts available and things like sanitary products and things available and um, i'm not sure with brazil so i wouldn't like to say but i know that in in bali like um female feminine hygiene products are really, really hard to get hold of and very expensive. So I would take those with you if you were coming to Bali. Yeah, um, fine. I don't know what it's like in Brazil, but I would just make sure that you do look into what's readily available and just take a couple of home comforts with you like that or some things that you yeah. might definitely need while you're there. Yeah, okay. I know that was a big thing in Mozambique last year um, because there wasn't where... Where they where we were last year in Mozambique were forty five minutes away from any form of real provisions, uh, so be able to get access. So they, they were I think it's a washable one. I don't know. I'm a guy. I don't know. Is it washable sanitary towels that you get? Um, the only thing that they can get access because, like Amy said, they're so expensive. There is a, for example, a South African shop, but it's three times the cost that it would be here in, in the UK. So nobody goes because yeah. the locals can't afford uh, to put in. The only reason it's that cost is because South Africa is a thousand miles away from well, where uh, Fjordbergs a thousand kilometres away from um, Indian Bank. Um, so they're just putting a tax on top of it for the transportation. But then it becomes so expensive. Um, and you know, I, I think the thing that would definitely be beneficial for a bit of days can it have a look at what type of foods there are, um, because some of the foods that you have can be quite spicy. 
Um, and if you're not used to that type of spice, um, you just make sure that you've got a good range. It was fortunate enough in Mozambique, they, they had a really good programme. So your breakfast and your lunch were catered for and your evening meal was catered for. Um, but they could have up to 20 volunteers coming from around the world doing marine conservation. Um, and you were all included because it was a massive big table. At six o'clock every night, everybody sat down. Um, and everybody had a meal together, which meant then you get the chance to sit and converse with people. And then after that, you can do what you want. Um, most of the volunteers all stayed together and the staff stayed together. Um, and they just made that because otherwise, at times, you know what it's like um, if there's an issue going on, volunteers want to speak to people. Whereas if there is an issue, then they deal with it in the next morning. Um, and it just made it made a, it actually made quite a harmonious uh, atmosphere because everybody knew where they were meant to be at certain times, but they were also catered for in terms of fooding, and all of it was vegetarian because it's all coming out of the local ground, which was ideal for a lot of people, and it wasn't spicy. Okay, thank you. Uh, just another quick question, Ash. Yeah. Um, so Adam, the ambassador for Brazil, uh, will he be going out for um, for a two week period, or will he be going out for longer? I am honestly not a hundred percent sure. Okay. Um. Yeah. So he will be there during the the time period that's like on the form and on the website. Um. But I'm still waiting to hear back from him on when specifically it is and how long. It will be at least a two week thing, if that's of any help. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he'll, uh, Jillian, in the same way that Amy and I would go out, um, maybe two weeks ahead of the program, so that we can do the course delivery, um, for the staff, and then the volunteers might come out beyond that. So that way then it basically all the staff are qualified and then it's just a case that you go and deliver the programme. That's the way Mozambique works. Um, not quite the same in Peru. I don't know how that would be for you, Amy. Is that about the same for you? Mine's slightly different, but it's only because it's already, they've already got quite a good curriculum set up. So right, right. Ours, ours is different. But I know that Adam did want to go to head up the front end of it. So yeah, 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 yeah. you could be right. So it, it might, there might be a week or two that he's ahead of you, Jillian. Um, okay. But he should be there for the actual delivery of the kids' programmes because that's ultimately what he's there for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in terms of being picked up from the airport, how does the company on the ground over there uh, know uh, when to pick you up? So... So is it, when you go... Um, so what we do is we get the flight details from you and okay. we compile it together with some other information and stuff and we give it to the partner program so that they can see everybody's um, arrivals and departures and then arrange their driving accordingly. Because I think it's usually somebody who is part of the organization who drives to pick you up rather than them like hiring a cab type of service um so we give them the details directly and then they make sure that they're there for you does that okay. answer the so question the whites of peru and there was a taxi service so we actually got a taxi to the airport so i get i get picked up with the taxi and then when georgina came out again because she was uh, female um, and the, 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 there's nothing wrong with that area of Peru. There's no issues in that area of Peru. But it was more about just familiarisation with somebody that could speak her own language. Um, in Mozambique, um, if it's not the um, NGO owner, it'll be some of one member of our two members of the staff will come out because it's a 45 minute journey from Inyaban back to Jakarta. Um, but they come and pick you up so they know the times. Mm -hmm. Um, they've even got well that over there they've got a really good solid program because it's been running for ten years, um, and they've got everything. The girl that runs it's really really uh, straight down the line, so they know everything and they're even conversing with you before because uh, you either fly into Maputo or 
you'll be flying to Johannesburg and they know what the time schedules are and etc. Um, so yeah, we will look after you um, and we will follow you all the way. So if there's any updates, uh, so for example, when Georgina was flying, I, I got her number before she left London. Um, I made sure that her flight was leaving on time because I got her to message me. Then I looked at the uh, the departure time. Then I then looked. I kept an eye on the plane. Kept an eye on the updates. Um, so I knew when to expect her. So I knew when she flew into Joburg. Um, and then again when she was departing from Joburg, I knew exactly. Uh, we we the 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 flights in Mozambique are not the the best in terms of actual times that they're meant to leave on. Um, but we just stayed at the airport until six time she arrived, which was a good kind of 45 minutes after it was meant to. But we tracked her all the way across and all the NGOs should do something of a similar nature. And it, even if it's a case of you saying, look, can you take my number? Can I get somebody's number there? Think about using WhatsApp or whatever they use in the home country use that software so if you have to download it just for that do it because that otherwise it's going to cost you a fortune to send messages backwards and forwards and whatsapp stuff to you yeah mm -hmm. yeah um yeah exactly the same in indonesia it, in bali they just collected you from the airport tracked your flights there is somebody there for you all the time so we even decided that when we actually had a weekend off we wanted to go to a different part of the island and stay there for a couple of nights and they took us they took us to the villa that we were staying in they picked us up from the villa we were staying in brought us straight back to the swim do house so there was they, they will cater for everything that you need yeah. as long as yeah. it's doable okay are we able to communicate with anybody on the ground over there before we go or not you should be so if you've got um adam's number uh, obviously, maybe not right now because I don't know what I, I actually don't know what the dates are for Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. But for example, Adam should really realistically be um, trying to get somebody's number over there or ask for it. Just say, "Can I get somebody's number?" Try and get a hold of somebody within the NGO or within the partner uh, charity so that you feel comfortable who you're dealing with. They might not necessarily be able to speak to you because they might not be able to speak English. Um, for example, when I was coming back through Peru, um, I ended up at the Olympic uh, village, uh, San Bora, I think it was called, um, and two people picked me up. Well, sorry, I got a taxi from the airport, and then they picked me up in San Bora, um, and, and they took me, but I was conversing with that person because... A lot of people, if you're not used to traveling in, in these underdeveloped countries, um, it's not scary. It's a great adventure. I would, I would tell anybody to go and do this absolutely any time because it's an amazing experience. But I think as long as you've got somebody who's on the other side of the phone that you can pick up and say, look, I need help, then just make sure that you get what you need out of it rather than expecting us to give it to you because and it's not that we don't want to but just ask for it because people will be receptive we okay will, we will make sure that you've got re like relevant contact details before going over um and ideally put you well i mean you'll already be getting in contact with adam um but that would have been a part of it as well um and especially if you end up going at the same time as him he should probably be there first and will be able to be kind of your ground control person oh no it's david bowie uh, yeah sorry <laughs> david bowie sorry. <laughs> will be your contact <laughs> but jillian if you feel like you you want my number or i'm, I'm sure robert would be happy to give you a absolutely name. Yeah, any help or support mm -hmm. you need. I know we're not in Brazil, but we will put you in touch. We'll, if you're stuck struggling to, to get hold of anybody, contact us and we'll do whatever we can to try and help you out. There's, there's lots of people here that are there to help you out. Don't, don't, don't think you're ever on your own. And even if you did yeah. get to Brazil um, and you need to speak to somebody, if you've got our numbers, just make contact. 
because we can make things happen even although I'm in Dubai, you guys are in Brazil and Amy's in uh, the UK. We can make things happen and we can look after you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Are there any other questions right now? Caitlin's very quiet. She fell asleep. Yeah, I don't have any questions though. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, if... Gib- Gibriel? Gibriel will come up with a message somewhere. Yeah. Um, if any of you do have any questions later, feel free to reach out to any of us. You all have my email. Um, Gabriel has no questions, so he's good. Um, you have my email. You probably have the Swim Tyke a Volunteer email as well. Um, lots of sources. Uh, so if you do have questions later, just shoot an email or a text, and we'll we'll deal with that. We'll also have more webinars coming up as well that you'll all be invited to. Um, so if you wanted to save your questions for those, you could. If not just shoot them and we'll have them answered as quick as we can um on that note i think yeah sorry no robert you go uh, just just before we finish off have you all of you found this valuable and is there anything that you think we could be doing better to try and improve on uh, your experience of dealing with us but also your um involvement and heading off even if you want to email them to ash Mm -hmm. um we're always looking to make sure that we're doing the right thing for you guys i'm the type of person that will just go and jump on a plane and head off i'm i'm just that kind of mad scottish person that will do something like that (laughs) um and not everybody's like that uh, because we had a girl in moz in 2022 she was only 21, never been out of Lincolnshire and her wife and her son decided to go to Mozambique, uh, which was a massive experience for her. And it was, it, she loved every minute of it. But um, we did into that. Our dad, stepdad, was really quite anxious. Um, and uh, it was, it, she was making her anxious and there was no need for it. And it, there was so much communication. Again, that was somebody else that we tracked the whole way through. She landed in uh, Joburg. We had a conversation in Joburg as soon as she got internet. And then I was I was telling her, because I'd been to Joburg already, and telling her how to get around the airport and all these. We will track everything for you. And if there's anything that we can do here to try and improve on this, and I think Ash has done a, a great job, um, but if there's anything you think that we, we, could, bene- or we could benefit you in, then if you wouldn't mind, let us know and, and we can try and improve on that in the future. Absolutely. We always want to be better. And that means being better for the volunteers. Um, yeah, again, any questions, shoot us a message. Any comments, critiques, opinions, all of that, uh, we want it. So we're always here. And yeah, I don't really think there is anything else to say um yeah amy so just very very quickly don't forget to get your travel insurance yeah 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 Yeah. yep if you need to get vaccinations make sure you get them in plenty of time amy's very very i've had mine today and i feel poorly from (laughs) so (laughs) make sure you're not doing it on a busy day (laughs) because i'm sat here staring at the screen like like i'm I'm rocking a little bit i'm gonna go to bed now um malaria tablets don't buy them in the uk because they're extortion there is quite a lot of countries when i was out in ghana in 2018 um I, i spent a fortune on um malaria tablets because yeah, I can't remember what it's something like you need to take them three weeks before you leave all the time every day that you're there and then three weeks after uh, something like that I can't remember and it was like 110 pounds and you can go to a pharmacy in uh, the central area of Accra and get a tablet for a pound, one pound fifty 
and it does the same job that we spent £110 on. So I, I would check. You can check the, um, uh, the immigration, the, the, the local government website, to whether you should be getting uh, malaria tablets. And if they say yes, I think there's doxycycline and there's another one. I can't remember what the other one is. But they're all, the two of them are very expensive. And if you can get something when you're out there, it's far better. And most of the people will tell you that you don't need to get anything until such time as it happens, which I wouldn't necessarily agree on that. Um, but certainly look into what the cost of it would be when you get there and do it before you leave. Good advice. Um, just quickly before we all go, is it okay if with everybody if a recording of this meeting is shared with other volunteers who weren't able to make it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, no. No, actually, I'm not happy. Okay, well... I'm not, I didn't do my hair. Yeah, I can see that. Um, <laughs> I'll just put um, a weird crop over you. Or All right, fine. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, An emoji or something? Yeah, and I'll, I'll modify your voice as well. Yeah, make it sound, make it sound American. I was going to make it sound like a robot, but yeah. Oh, yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's um, fine. I don't have a problem with it. Okay. So uh, I think that's everything for now. It was really great to have you all come and have our little chat. And I hope to see you again soon on a future webinar, which you will get yeah. details to. <laughs>